Hello. I'm um, the company of H. I have a Bachelor of Agriculture and specialize in the management of natural resources. I have been working on preserving our ecosystem since 2017. Now, before starting, we have a message basically for a campaign. That was a message we were doing for announcing our event. Please listen to the message from Jessica Lee from the United States. Hello, I am Jessica Lee from the United States of America. Water forms is the most essential liquid on Earth. It is made of tiny units called molecules, which are combinations of smaller units called atoms. Without water, essential sustenance is not possible. Unfortunately, water is not finite. Furthermore, microbes, salt, contamination, and pollution from agricultural and industrial productions, for example, threaten water sources as clean, drinkable, and sanitized water are needed for sustenance. According to statistics, more than 37 million people in California are impacted by droughts. January 2022 remains as one of the driest months. The constant drought condition has challenged agricultural productions from reaching their optimal capacity, increased the likelihood of developing or aggravating health issues, including respiratory diseases and heat strokes, and prompted locals to take up water conservation measures, issuing notifications in communities. Water is essential for everyday life. Whether this is as simple as having clean and drinkable water, water to washing vegetables and prepare for a nice home meal, or flushing the toilet. We need to provide sustainable water management to ensure continuous, uninterrupted water services for agricultural production, irrigation, living, entertainment, business, and social functioning. Overpumping of groundwater has led to subsidence. Acts, policies, and action plans, such as the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and the Groundwater Sustainability Plan, are enacted to prepare, respond, and maintain water management, such as groundwater management. The California Department of Water Resources, for example, helps locals to manage groundwater use. Examining the relationship between hazards and disasters, supply and quality of water, and our interactions and needs, we continue to seek innovative and sustainable measures to address the climate reality. And this requires collaboration between public and private sectors, communities, NGOs, civil society, and individuals. For those reasons, this year, to raise awareness on the importance of water and celebrate the World Water Day, Yongo, the Nature Working Group, Water Working Group, Ocean's Voice, and Young Power organized online conferences on the 19th and 22nd of March 2022 under the theme, Impact of Climate Change on Groundwater Aquifer, The Way Forward. The convenience of virtual conferences lets you to actively engage in discussions anywhere 
please register by filling out the Google form. We hope to see you this year at the conferences. Thank Jessica Lee for the time. We really appreciate your video. It was very helpful. Thank you so much. Now we have today is a wonderful day. It's World Water Day. Every place in the world, you and other organization that works on water, organize activity, webinar that relates to water. And as young go, we are working on different point of the natural resources, agriculture, and ocean. So it is significant for us to organize this webinar so that many people can learn up about water, about how important is the water. Now, I'm going to share with you the program for today. What do we have today? for the World Water Day, organized by Yongo. First, firstly, we have um, me um, as the moderator of this activity. And also we'll have Guanyin Simbe, is from the government of Malawi. He will talk about impact of climate change on freshwater resources. And after we'll have Dr. Ahmed Uda from UNIP. He will talk about water security and earth. And after we'll have Shwadi Manchikanti. She's from UNICEF India. She will talk about the effects of groundwater pollution on human health and how to overcome it. And we'll have Dr. Edle Jamilie. Um, he has um, actually of ecology. He will talk about biodiversity and water. And Virginia Bachesi from UNICEF. She will talk about youth and gadget for climate response. And we'll have breakout session. So some specific question that we will work on from your community and all will use your mind to resolve those problems. We'll have Eli Sawa, you'll have me, you'll have Jessica Lee as facilitator for the breakout room so that we can have a great time. And then we have Yoko Lu from that Nature Working Group. She goes to talk about climate ash pathway water. And then that's the head of our activity. So now we are going to start our activity with Brian Sibe. So Brian Sibe, so he goes to share his screen about his presentation and goes to talk about the climate change and water. Brian, you can talk. I hope you can Yes, are you you? Sorry, I'm, my network is very small, so I'll try. So I'm right today, I'm from uh, I got a bachelor's degree in natural resources management, and I'm very So today I'm going to take you through my resources. So, uh, during, during the same presentation, I'll give you two case studies from Malawi. One is these are based on the research studies which are done by one of them is by my school and one of is done by my colleague. So I can go along with this and this case studies to you. Thank 
So actually, with the coming of climate change, this has uh, challenged uh, managers as well as researchers to find sustainable management solutions in order to you know, but, hello. Yeah, I don't know if you can fix your mic because it's a little nosy. Maybe you can try to fix it. We don't really hear you very well. Your mic go for Please. <laughs> Um, can you try to stop without the microphone? Maybe it can be better. Just try to see. Switch my devices. Okay, maybe um send the presentation so I can read it. Yeah, we can talk. We can talk now. Just share your screen. Hi. Yeah. Oh. Okay, maybe while Brian is trying to fix his microphone, we're gonna uh, start with the second presentation and after we will go back to Brian. Okay, now we're gonna hear um, Dr. Ahmed Uda from UNEP. He goes to talk about water security in Earth. Dr. Ahmed, we are happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to see you all here. So I will start my presentation. Okay. First of all, my name is Ahmed Oda. I am from Palestine. I am here representing the UNIP major group, Children and Youth. Uh, I'm, I am actually a medical student at the final year. Uh, and also uh, I am a youth task force of the Stockholm of last 50. So I will take you here and to my journey. First, I will talk about the water security. So what is the meaning of the, the water security or, or the definition of the water security? That definition of the water security is the uh, 
is the reliable availability uh, of an acceptable a quantity and the quality of water for health and life hoods and uh, protection coupled with acceptable level of water uh, related uh, risks. So the water security is considered to be a necessity of a sustainable development for its important the quality of life of the people in region. A water security is, uh, is uh, therefore also linked to social justice, equitable uh, distribution of uh, a distribution of environmental benefits and harms, uh, sustainable developments would result the lower poverty and increasing the living standard water resources in the region, especially for the women and for the children. The second one, we will go to the fresh water. According to the UN water, the total usable fresh water supply for the ecosystem and humans is only about 200,000 cubic kilometers of water, less than 1% of all freshwater resources. Uh, usable freshwater includes a water not contaminated or degraded by water, alternating the chemicals such as the sewage or, or any other harmful chemical from continuous uh, uh, previous use. So we are here talking about the fresh water. So I will take you to the numbers. The numbers here, if you are seeing the screen. Uh, okay, let me just remove this one. Okay. If we, I, if we see that in the screen in the 20th of the century, water use, uh, use has been a growing at more than twice. The rate of the population increase is uh, uh, specifically water withdrawal are, are you predicted to increase by the 50% by the 25th in developing countries and 80% in developing countries right now. Uh, in like, let, uh, let's say in the one uh, let's say for the example into the one continent we have Africa uh, has been predicated to have 75 into the 250 million inhabitants lacking uh, access to the fresh water by okay by the 20 uh, by the 20 and the 25th, one point billion people will be living in countries and regions with absolute water uh, security. And two uh, and the two of thirds of the water uh, of the world population could be under a stress condition. So we are seeing here in the in the map that we are seeing the MENA region and the North Africa countries that they will suffering from the stress. So if we are looking into the purple ones, so these countries will having the extremely high water stress. Also the Algeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, India, and all these countries must be very well uh, prepared to facing this crisis. So, Okay. So let me talk about the threats of water security. First of all, the most common one, and uh, the most common one is the water security. There can be several causes to the water security, like it's low rainfall, a climate change, or high pollution density or, or 
or even the overall location of the water source. About, about the 27th of the water uh, of the world uh, population lived in the areas affected by water security in the mid of the uh, in the mid of the 2010. So we are talking about in the mid of the 2010. So can you just imagine what will be happen after the 40 years if we are starting from the date of the 2010? Even by like it will be increasing to 42 a percent of the what of the world population will be affected by the water security because of the over uh, urination relative into the water resources can also uh, create a conditions of the rapidly the de uh, to trinating household and water security so the other cause and its environmental uh, issues that these includes like the nutrition and the bestates and the herbicides of are actually usually using for the agriculture and and also the heavy metal are usually from the industry and pre and the polyfluoroalkyne substance or forever chemicals uh, a climate change, natural uh, uh, disasters, contaminates can enter to the uh, water source naturally through the flooding. Uh, contaminates also can be a problem if, if, the, uh, if the people or the population switching their water supply from the service water into the groundwater, or even from the one service source to the another. And also we having other, other threats to the water security include like the tourism, the radiation, danger uh, due to the nuclear accidents. So let me take you this part, it was a part talking the water security and the definition of the water security. So let us take, uh, uh, sorry, let me take you to the health and how that, and how that relation between the health and the water security. First, I will take you into the small journey, another one about the overview, the key facts, then the water and health, then the challenges. The overview that it's safe and uh, and the re, uh, readily uh, available water, it's important for the public health, whether it's used for the drinking, domestic use, food, uh, food protection, improved the water supply and uh, sanitation, and better management of the water resources can force countries economic growth and contribute uh, gradually to poverty reduction. So in the uh, so in the 2010, the UNGA uh, recognized that the human rights to water and sanitation, everyone ha having the right to have sufficient, continuous, safe, acceptable, physical, accessible, affordable water for, for personal and domestic use. The key facts, I know it's, it's actually a lot in the screen, but these facts are very important because she just giving us how will be the future will be. So in the 2020, we having about 74 of the global population, it's like around 5.8 billion people used a safely managed a drinking water service that that is located okay um premises available when needed and free from contamination so that's actually very good 
news, but there is also the bad news that globally, at least we have 2 billion people use drinking water source contaminated with the feces and microbial contaminated of drinking water as, as a result of contamination with the feces, uh, poisons, the, the, the greatest risk to drinking water safety. The microbiological contaminated uh, drink can transmit diseases and like the diarrhea, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, polio, and is estimated to cause, look at the number, 485,000 diarrheal deaths each year. And most, and most of these deaths actually from, it's actually uh, coming from the children's side. While the most important uh, chemical risk in drinking water arrays from arsenic, fluoride, nitrate, emerging uh, contaminates such as uh, the medicines or such as the, uh, uh, the bestases or the polyfluoroalkyne substance. And also the microplastic generate public concern. So actually that's why at the UNEA 5 and then the past UNEA that we try to fighting the plastic. And also we try to just fighting the chemical waste also. Safe and sufficient water facilities, the practice of the hygiene, which is a key, a measure to prevent not only the diarrheal diseases, but also the acute respiratory infections. Over 2 billion people live in water stressed country, which is accepted to be exacer uh, uh, exacerbated in some regions as a result of the climate change and the population growth. So we are here looking, sorry, we are here looking, sorry about that. So in 2019, in, uh, in least development countries, only 50% of the healthcare facilities had a basic water service and, and, and the 37 had the basic meditation services and 30% has a basic waste management services. So here is the example or just this picture explaining how the water supply system can just being affecting us with the diseases. So if we having the lake and the groundwater, so if we having the contamination into the our lake, so it so it will go into the groundwater and then the non and then to the non bipted water supply and bipted water supply, then the tap water, then the drinking the water. So there is direct relation between the water supply system and also the water security between the health and the water security. So as you see that we having the polio, we having uh, schistosomas, we having a gastroenteritis and most, I said before that most of these deaf people, it's coming from the children's side. So here is actually the challenges that, that we are facing it. Uh, actually, we are facing a historical rates of the progressive uh, would need to double for the world to achieve a, a universal uh, coverage with the basic drinking water services by, by the 2030. To achieve AI universal safely managed uh, managed services, rates would need to 
a quadruple a climate change, increasing water security, population growth, and demographic yeah. changes. And I said before that yeah, over over of two billion people will suffering from the water stress and the water uh, in the water stress countries and into the water security. So I will move into the second slide. Okay. The WHO. The WHO is an international authority on the public health and water quality. WHO lead, leads a global uh, efforts to prevent water uh, related diseases advising the government on the development of the health basic targets and the regulation so so actually the who just uh, just uh, produce as uh, many series of water quality guidelines including the drinking water and safe use for of wastewater and the water equality guidelines are basic on managing the risk since 2004 of the guidelines for the drinking water and the promote the framework to save drinking water and the framework re uh, recommends establish, uh, establishment of the health based uh, targets to development and to the implementation of water uh, safety plans by water supplies. So there is a strong relation between, uh, between the WHO and the UNICEF. The WHO works closely with the UNICEF in a number of areas concerning our water and health, including on water, sanitation and hygiene in healthcare facilities. In 2015, uh, two agencies in jointly developed like a wash fit. A wash fit, it's actually water and sanitation for health facility improvement tool and adoption of the water health plan approach, the Actually, the watch fit aims to guide the small and uh, also the primary health care facilities in the low and middle country uh, income, setting through the continuous cycle of improvement through the assessment, polarization of risk, and definition of the specific targeted action. In uh, in 2019, a report uh, described the practical steps that countries can take to improve the water and the sanitation and the hygiene in the healthcare facilities. So at the end, I would like to thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry if I take too long, but I'm trying to to just uh, ha uh, to just consist into the 30 minutes the session and thank you and the floor is yours to the facilitator thank you uh, dr ahmed buddha for your wonderful presentation we really appreciate it now if you have any question you can as directly to Dr. Ahmed before we jump into You can raise your hand if you have questions, Dr. Ahmed. Can raise your hand so that we can ask ask the question. Okay. If you don't have question, again. Thank you. 
player. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Now we're going to go back to um, now. I'm going to talk about impact of climate change on resources. Dr. Ahmed, um, we are happy to have you. Hello, Mr. Hello, Mr. Bynes. Hi, hello, you are breaking up, sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, let me just get you to my presentation. All right, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Yeah, so as I already introduced myself, I'm Brian Sinde. I'm working with the government of Malawi and uh, under the Department of Land Resources and Conservation. So I'm going to take you through this presentation on impacts of climate change on freshwater resources. Actually, inside my presentation, I have two case studies just to show you the practical consequences mm -hmm. of uh, climate change on water resources. Yeah, so to begin with, uh, the emergence of climate change actually has challenged uh, water managers and researchers like myself to find sustainable management solutions. This is done in order to avoid the undesirable impacts of water resources, on water resources, environment and water dependent sectors as well. So actually, mm -hmm. water resources av availability at any region is, is influenced by uh, complex natural interactions. This is between climatological conditions. So what are these climatological conditions? Here I'm talking about uh, rainfall and temperature and the natural hydrological cycle processes. So with these uh, climatological conditions, surface water has directly been affected by climate change. This is due to its exposure to the surface of the earth rather than uh, as compared to groundwater. So the greatest climate change impacts are likely to be felt through water. That's according to the to WHO and DIFID. So this is to mean that um, any change, any slight change in either precipitation or temperature is likely to be noticed or to be felt through the presence or absence of water. That's why they, have, they went further to conclude that water bodies are highly sensitive to climate mm -hmm. change. This is to mean they're highly sensitive to both. Uh, actually, to, when we say climate change, we, uh, we have the main forcing, which is temperature and rainfall it acts like the resultant variable. So these, so water resources are highly sensitive to temperature. So when we say they're highly sensitive to temperature, we're talking about evaporation, which reduces water, water quantity. Yeah. So water level fluctuations in water bodies are expressive pointers of climate change. So with the changing system of climate, studies have shown that water resources are under mounting pressure. This is from the demands of the growing population. Uh, during the first day of the presentation, I think we had a presentation where one of our presenters talked about the importance of water. And in, in our conclusion, she, she pointed it out that um, water is uh, very useful almost for all, if not everything. Yeah, so we, we require water for most of the activities that we do. So it doesn't matter where we, whether we have or we don't have water, we actually strive each day to find water. We can't survive without water. So we have a growing population, as well as apart from the growing population, we have um, climate change, which is increasing day by day. And its impacts are growing. And as I have already said that water bodies are highly sensitive to climate change. This mounting pressure and demand on the water bodies and which uh, when combined with climate change are highly, highly to affect the presence and absence of water. The changes to the hydraulic cycle due to climate change will continue to deteriorate the quantity, quality and accessibility of water resources. 
So here, when you talk about the quantity, I've already pointed out the issue of temperature decreasing the water levels, that's the surface water. And uh, when we say quality, uh, as we already know, climate change has led to increased disasters like floods. So when you have floods, we are likely to have reduced water quality. Or well, for instance, okay, we don't have floods, but the quantity of water has decreased due to climate change. And we have a growing population. Uh, we create scenarios whereby we have too little water and too dirty. So quality is likely to, to be affected. And when we talk about accessibility of water resources in relation to climate change, uh, surface water is the most abstracted water resource. So when you talk of accessibility, it's whereby we have reduced levels of surface water. So people tend to turn to groundwater for their day-to-day -day activity to sustain their mm -hmm. livelihoods. As I've already said that uh, we can't survive without water. So when, when, uh, when surface water is absent, people tend to groundwater abstraction. So mostly in most parts of the world, these groundwater policies are there, yes, but they have gone unchecked. The abstraction of groundwater has gone unchecked. So there is, there is that uh, careless withdrawing of water from the ground. So actually with the, um, with the fact that uh, most of the, I think according to, according to the, to water aid, they say, for example, for the continent of, of Africa, they say that we have enough groundwater to sustain us for the next five years. But a question might arise whereby we might say with the growing, in, growing impacts of climate change, then after we use those waters after the five years, and we don't stop climate change, then what else? So below here, you can see a picture whereby uh, there's a lady there drawing some water. You can see the surrounding that this is a dry area. So you can ask yourself, uh, looking at the levels of this water here, if, if let's say for instance, that, that small well, that shallow well is supporting about um, uh, not less than 200 people. What can you say about the quality? Yeah. So with the changing climate system, general circulation models, these are models which predict um, the changing the temperatures as well as the precipitation. Uh, they have projected an increase in global temperature and a decline in precipitation. As I already said, under climate change, we look at mainly two variables, which are temperature and rainfall, which is precipitation here. So with the projections of increasing temperatures and a decline in precipitation, so the hydrological cycle, is mainly fed by, is mainly sustained by precipitation. So with the growing, tem glo growing global temperatures, which have been projected here, and a decline in precipitation, we can see that we are, we are, we are, at a, we are, we are in a situation whereby we have to act now. I think that's, uh, as I also referred to the first day of the conference, I think it was Batis's uh, presentation, where he was emphasizing more on acting now. So this is just to alarm you that uh, the time is act, to act is now, mm -hmm. not later. So yeah, so combining the low precipitation with high evaporation losses, the order deficit may, 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 may evolve to soil moisture drought, which in turn can lead to reduced groundwater recharge and eventually low stream flow. Uh, here, when we talk of actually, of course, uh, as our theme as of world order data for today, is uh, groundwater. So why are we talking about surface water? Groundwater, for us to have groundwater, the main source of groundwater is surface water. So when we have, uh, as, as predicted by the general circulation models, the uh, increased evaporation losses and low precipitation. So precip surface water has a source and its source is precipitation. So with the increased uh, susceptibility of surface water to evaporation, and the combined effects of low precipitation, we have high evaporation losses, which is a direct loss of water, surface water, which will lead to low water quality, what will low water quantity rather than quality. Yeah, so the water deficit might evolve to low soil moisture, soil moisture drought. So this soil moisture drought, as we all know that groundwater, its, its main home is the soil. So when we have soil moisture drought, this means we are having reduced groundwater levels. So with this, with the low precipitation, low surface water availability and soil moisture drought can lead to reduced groundwater recharge. So this is because groundwater, for us to have groundwater, we have surface water which sits down into the soil to recharge the groundwater. And eventually this will lead to low stream flow. 
this stream flow, we are talking about the flow of rivers, streams, and as you all know that uh, lakes and oceans uh, have their sources of water from the streams and uh, rivers. So this diagram here on uh, just trying to show you the process of, I might call it a water, water balance, like the inputs and outputs of water. So here we have the main sources of water, which is precipitation and we have evaporation here. So you can just link this diagram to what the global circulation models have predicted uh, of evaporation. So the evaporation arrow is pointing upwards. That's, that indicates a loss of water. Precipitation is indicating downwards. That's a gain in water. So with the increase in uh, evaporation losses and a decrease in the input of water from precipitation, I think the results are quite clear there. So with the fact that we can't live without water, most of our economic activities, they rely on water. Yeah, so I think it's high time we put a value on water. It's high time we respect water. We give it the respect it deserves so that we treat it, so that we treat it with the with a mind of conserving it. Yeah. So here we have inflow, that's water that runs on the surface, groundwater inflows. Oh, this is the water from the ground. This groundwater recharges. That's why we have uh, during uh, dry seasons, you still have running rivers. You might wonder where the water is coming from when we have no rain for events. That's the groundwater so trying to sustain us. So actually, I might go down to uh, regions that rely on uh, irrigation agriculture, for instance. So when we have uh, reduced groundwater flow, so we might have a chain of impacts, a chain reaction, I might say. We have agriculture impacted. Some economies rely on agriculture. That economy will be impacted. Apart from that, agriculture has been impacted. We can't live without food. So that means we have um, health problems. That will mean more economic losses. So I think, not I think, but it's a fact that water has to be respected and treated with the ultimate respect it deserves. So rainfall is the main driver of the hydrological cycle as I already highlighted and has been varying in most parts of the world. This is to say, um, we can't generalize rainfall for each and every region. Each and every region has its own uh, seasons. It has its own uh, history of rainfall. It has its own hydrological history. So with the coming in of, with the emergence, not coming, but the emergence of climate change, we have had uh, mm -hmm. regions whereby, um, we have, we have had regions whereby their historical, their, where their historical seasons of having abundant rainfall have been turned to regions of drought. These are all effects of climate change. So in this view, regionalizing the hydrological response under a, climatic, under a changing climate is a need. That's for better water resources management. So here I just brought you this hydrological system for you to appreciate uh, the surface water, the role that surface water plays in recharging groundwater. Although yes, we might have a lot of variables, a lot of factors here, but I want you to focus on surface water recharging groundwater and groundwater recharging back the surface, giving back, it's like giving back to the surface water during the dry seasons. So without surface water, we have no groundwater. This is because for, for us to have groundwater, surface water has to recharge the groundwater and then we might have groundwater. So groundwater is basically the water that was once surface water, but I just sipped down to the unsaturated regions of the soil. Yeah, so here I'm trying to give you, I want to give you the practical mm -hmm. case studies that we have done here in Malawi. As I've already said, these are research studies which are done on two, on two, catchment areas. Uh, so I'll, this, this is just to let you appreciate how much climate change has had an impact on water resources. So the first case study is, uh, was done on a small catchment in the south, southern part of Malawi. So its title was hydrological response of small catchments to climate change and decreasing vegetative cover. Actually, what this research was aimed at was actually to understand the impact of climate change and vegetative cover change on stream flow. Uh, what, has, what, what relevance has this on groundwater? Actually, for, as I've already highlighted that for us to have groundwater, we first have uh, surface water. So what role does vegetative cover have in groundwater? Actually, when we have uh, surface runoff, 
water in most uh, under different slopes under different soil types water tends to seep down seeps it seeps down to the groundwater so the vegetative cover acts like um, it aids in reducing the flow of water so that it might have time to seep down to the groundwater so that groundwater is recharged which is used during the dry season for different activities yeah, so this under this research, uh, the methodology involved uh, collecting uh, climatological data and stream flow data. The climatological data involved uh, rainfall data for the period of 30 years that it ranged from um, 1970 to 2010, yeah, a period of 40 years. So rainfall over the catchment was averaged using GIS and land cover change was analyzed using GIS. So in the key findings of this study were that um, we try to pair rainfall and stream flow in order to find the impacts of rainfall, which is a direct result of climate change on how rivers flowed. Uh, this showed a relationship whereby the trend, how rainfall is behaving and how streamfall is behaving, they had the same trend, they had the same flow. When rainfall decreased, streamfall as well decreased. That's the river flows. Yeah, so this meant uh, a direct impact of rainfall on how the streams behaved and furthermore went down to find out how much uh, how much um, the both rainfall and river flows are deviated from the long-term average that's how for, for the long-term average that's how they have been behaving over a long period of time so there was a shift which had no distinctive pattern so this was so this shows how much climate change has impacted uh, river flows. So we have, uh, you might see that as uh, when uh, rainfall deviated from the normal long-term long average, streamfall followed, followed the same trend. So this means uh, there was a direct relationship between rainfall and stream flow. So I want you, I want you to focus more on uh, what I already said earlier on the predictions that temperatures, temperatures increasing and precipitation is decreasing. So with this direct relationship that we have on stream flow and rainfall, as rainfall increase, uh, river flows increase as well. So what, we, what, what of the projected impacts that we have been, that have been observed, that have been reported by different organizations, including the World Meteorology Organization, ICPCC reports have reported the same. So the decreased, uh, this means the decreased precipitation will highly affect the presence of surface water. So when we don't have surface water, people turn to uh, underground water, groundwater. So this means uh, both surface water, in general, water availability in the future, if we don't act now, it will be highly affected. Yeah, so this was uh, the finding on the vegetative cover. So actually there was an inverse relationship in terms of land cover and surface runoff. So surface runoff actually tends to depend more on uh, land, uh, forest cover as well as soil type. So the relationship here of how the water seeped down into the ground didn't follow much uh, the presence of vegetation or not. Yeah, so here I, we produce the runoff coefficient. So what is this runoff coefficient? It indicates how much water seeps down into the ground to have ground, ground flow, to have groundwater. So for the year 1980 to 84, we had uh, 0.699 which means 30% uh, 30 30 of the water for this year seeped down as groundwater. So when we have, so this should remind you, as I already said, you should have that, you should be reminded continuously of the global circulation models of increased temperatures and decreased precipitation. Yeah, so on the second case study as well, to find out more on what climate changes is like, on how climate change is likely, has likely impacted uh, surface water as well as rivers, streams, and consequently larger water bodies like lakes and rivers. So this case study was done by, uh, this research was done by Stanley Chira, and what he was trying to assess was the streamfall response of a river in Lilongwe. Lilongwe is actually the capital of Malawi, so he had a focus on the capital whereby we have an increased urbanization as well as we have a high population increase. So people in this region actually rely, as, our, as we have already highlighted that uh, we can't live without water. So people in this region are highly 
likely to use more water than in regions where we have low populations, as Lilongwe being the capital. So the aim of this study was to understand the current trends or how the uh, climatological parameters, when I say climatological parameters, I mean temperature and rainfall, they have, uh, they have been behaving as well as their future trends. So it was like a forecast, a projection. Yeah, so in his study, he used the temperature range from stream flow data, which was from 1972 to 2001. So I did a trend test to, to see how you, it was the river temperature and rainfall has been behaving and how it shall behave in the future. Yeah, so he, uh, he proposed two scenarios. Uh, the first scenario, A2, was uh, whereby uh, we have a heterogeneous world, a continuous increasing global population, and a regional oriented economic growth that is more fragmented. And the second scenario was uh, a, a family describes a world in which the emphasis on local conditions to economic, social, and environmental sustainability. So, and the second point was uh, a continuous increasing global population, but at a rate lower than the first scenario. So here we have uh, in the second, still in the second scenario, intermediate levels of economic, economic development, less rapid and more diverse technological change. Mm -hmm. So the key findings in this study were similar to the first case study, whereby rainfall and stream flow, the flow of Lilongo River followed the same trend. As rainfall increased, the flow of the river increased as well. As rainfall receded, the flow of the river receded as well. Yeah, so according to the projections on the simulations that he did, uh, actually what was established was that the temperature will increase. That's for the first scenario, A2, whereby we have a growing population, temperature was projected to increase, but under scenario B2, temperature increased, but not at a rate greater than that of the first scenario. And rainfall also decreased, under second scenario, rainfall decreased as well. So it's still here under the projections, as rainfall increased, the flow of the river increased as well. As rainfall decreased, the flow of the river followed the same trend. So it's a direct relationship between rainfall and river flows. So it's, I might say, in other words, I might say it's a direct relationship between the presence of surface water or groundwater with precipitation or with the climatological parameters. So indeed, here we might conclude that uh, climate change is having a toll on our water resources. So we can't be relying on uh, uh, assumptions like, oh, we have enough groundwater, enough, for instance, as I already reported, as I gave you the first example, not the first, the first scenario as reported by what I that Africa sits on enough groundwater to sustain us for the next five years. So still dwelling on that point, we might ask ourselves, so what, so what after the five years, if we deplete those groundwaters? And as well as you might agree with me that in the same Af Africa here, we have regions, we have areas that are, are highly water stressed, despite the fact that we have groundwater. So it's high time we act. We have to act now to save these ground surface water resources, which recharges the groundwater. Yes, when we, serve the, when we conserve surface water, we are conserving groundwater. So uh, as I already concluded, temperature, so temperature is the main forcing for climate change. Uh, temperatures, you hear what I'm trying to mean is uh, temperature is the determinant of how the climate will behave. So if the temperature increases, uh, actually the other uh, parameters like rainfall follow a, an inverse relationship whereby they are decreasing. So the most dominant climate driver for water availability is precipitation. That's according to the UNFCCC. This is an agreement with our findings here on the two case studies, whereby uh, the river flows were following the trend of the rainfall. So rainfall is the main forcing here. Yeah. So the vegetative cover, this depends, of course, it depends on the other parameters uh, like uh, soil type. So for the, for the first case study, we didn't look at the soil type, just look at the vegetative cover. So it has a minor influence on river flows of the catchment, but uh, we need vegetation uh, in our river catchments as well as in our river banks. This helps uh, in reducing the rates of evaporation. So we can't neglect having vegetative cover. So the decrease in stream flow therefore impacts not only on the stream ecology, but also the water supply within the city. 
So actually, you might agree with me that in most uh, urban cities in the world, they're having water problems. This is because the population is growing, but the presence of water is not following that trend. The presence of water is decreasing. So when we have uh, climate change impacting our rivers, our streams, it's not about only the ecology that's within the rivers, but actually, let's look at the people who depend on that river, on, that, on those waters. So groundwater is a, leader, is a hidden line of defense against the impacts of climate change. So what, what am I trying to say here? As I already said, groundwater is less, is less, is not directly impacted with, by climate change, by, climato, by climatological parameters like temperature, because it's underneath the ground. So at least it's not, it has, a, it's low, low, not highly susceptible to issues of evaporation or obstruction as well. Of course, we have increasing incidence of obstruction, but uh, these are increasing on surface water as compared to groundwater. So this is, uh, uh, by conserving groundwater, it's our first line of defense against the impact of climate change. So we have to do our, our best to help recharge this, these groundwaters. How can we do it? We have to conserve surface water first. Surface water, when you conserve surface water, it recharges the groundwater. So with the projected decrease in rainfall and increase in temperature, some immediate measures have to be taken to make sure that there's a sustainable availability of water resources. So if we don't do it for ourselves, let's do it for the coming generation. We might have enough water for now, but what of the generation that is coming? So, this, so with these scenarios, we have, we have decreasing uh, precipitation and increasing temperatures, which are likely to lead to increased evaporation rates. Uh, it's, uh, it's imperative to conclude now that stream flow would decrease in the near future. And so as youth, as youth, what role do we have in combating this? What shall we do in helping combating this? So here, the future is youth. We are the future. We have some more greater years to come. We have more years to come as we live on this earth. So actually when we relax now, we pay a huge price in the near future. So I, I would like to ask, ask the youth to engage more in climate action. Let's engage more in those activities that are directly mitigating the impacts of climate change. So there is need to involve more of the youth in planning stages of climate action, for climate action. So in a different, we have, uh, we have organizations, we have uh, that's at national as well as local community level. At these levels, let's involve the youth. When we involve the youth, actually we are building capacity in people that will lead this world in the future. We are building, uh, we are giving them skills as well as knowledge on how to plan uh, under the climate, yeah, under the changing climate. So this will help in uh, fighting climate change now and the years to come. So furthermore, communities have to be sensitized on groundwater and this conservation. So here actually, we have uh, communities that don't know anything about, we have populations that don't know anything about groundwater. They only know all the things that they see. What do they see? They see surface water. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, engage more in, uh, in advocating for uh, groundwater. Let's engage more in, uh, let's engage the communities in letting them know of the importance of groundwater and how this groundwater can be conserved. Uh, this, this will help us in uh, combating the effects, the impacts of climate change on our day-to-day -day livelihoods. So that's what I prepared for you today. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you. So lastly, I would say the soil is the greatest reservoir, conserve, conserve groundwater. So yeah, so if you have any, any questions, I, I would drop uh, my contact details in the chat box. Or if you have any other, things to talk to me if we are like collaborations, like anything else, I'll drop my contact details in the chat box. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brian for your presentation. What do you think could be the local 
Artist, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. I can't hear you clearly. I think uh, there might be a little bit of the technical difficulties with the connections here. Yes, I think uh, some of our participants are actually not able to hear the audio. Oh, but John, uh, John Lee is back. So I'm gonna give the floor back to John Lee. Thank you. So while John Lee is actually having uh, to reconnect to our session, and uh, I just want to say yes, and, and I want to say thank you so much uh, to the two speakers who have presented on the importance of water and on some of the ways that we can engage in to conserve water and to realize the importance of having to maintain a good water quality, as well as having a sustainable water management system in order to sustainably have water as our uh, sustenance to in order to um, maintain our everyday life functioning and also workings. And I just want to say thank you again for all the participants here of uh, actively engaging in the chat as well. So we're going to wait for a couple moments for Zhong Li to come back and hopefully his audio will be working again. And I see that uh, he's uh, he's actually on the on the line right now. So we should be connected with him soon. Oh, Zhong Li. Yes. OK, I'm here. Uh, okay, great. I, I hope you I don't know the question, the chat box. Uh, directly. So that's all your, your activity with um, Swadi Manchikansi talk about the effect of water pollution on human health and also over country. Ms. Swadi, we are very happy to have you. Hi. Hi, John Lee. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Unfortunately, I think your internet is still a little crackly, but it goes to show, I think, uh, you know, for the work that we need to do going forward, digital transformation also has to be a, a big part of what we do um, in whichever sector we're working in. So I'm just going to, uh, sorry, just quickly share my screen. Obviously, I also have a presentation here. Uh, so, yes, welcome to my talk. Um, so, thank you to Yango for inviting me um, and giving me this opportunity to talk about. I also want to thank um, Nirma. Nirma is, I think, also online right now. She and I work really closely together at UNICEF in the Indy office. Um, we both mm -hmm. are working to expand access to water and sanitation to all populations, especially marginalized populations, children and women in India. And we're also trying to make sure that while we're doing it, we're doing it in a way where 
where we're integrating resilience against climate change and disasters at every step. Um, it's a lot of work, but we find it really exciting. And so we're really excited to talk to you about um, one aspect of this as well, which is groundwater pollution um, and how it affects human health and also what kind of measures we're taking. So we're gonna share examples of what we're doing as UNICEF in India um, and, to, and then you guys can also help us reflect on how we can take this forward in other countries or whether other countries are already doing this as well that we can learn from. So uh, just a few quick uh, public health stats. Globally, 1.7 billion children are affected by diarrhea annually. Um, that's believable, right? All of us have had diarrhea at some point once a year. <laughs> so this is definitely believable. But what's crazy is that globally, half a million children die from diarrhea. And diarrhea is preventable. It does not take a lot of money a lot of solutions to preventing diarrhea are cost effective and really affordable, but still there's a lot of gaps and challenges. Ahead. Sorry, I think someone's mic is unmuted. If we could just mute that person. Thank you. Um, globally, 2 billion people use drinking water, uh, use a drinking water source contaminated with feces. And so it's, you know, human feces. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna ask that someone mute their mic. I think, John Lee, I'm just going to mute you. If I can, I cannot. Okay. Um, and then, you know, in India, 37.7 million people are affected by waterborne diseases annually. And in India, another 1.5 million children die of di diarrhea annually. And in India, 73 million people lose, 70, sorry, 73 million working days are lost because of waterborne diseases. So what does it mean when a working day is lost? It means that, you know, because you're sick, you know, when you try to go to school or college, university, a job, sometimes you get sick. And when you get sick, you stay at home. And for many people, when they stay at home and they can't go to work, they lose the money for that day, right? And so that means that because of waterborne diseases, lots of people in India together are losing 73 million working days in a year because of waterborne diseases. So that adds up to a lot of money. And you can think, you know, if you're losing that much money on an annual basis, what could you have done with that money? You can invest it in education, in food, in uh, building your house, you know, uh, or like growing a garden. All of this is lost all because we're not able to control um, waterborne disease as much as we want to. But before I kind of go into my little lecture or my knowledge sharing, I want to actually quiz you guys first. I think we have enough people on the line that this will be kind of fun. So can you guys go to, if you have your cell phone, um, just open a browser and type in www.menti.com. Um, or, and you can click, and you can type in the code 78748200. Let me see if I can type. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Jessica, I really appreciate it. So I'm just gonna switch my screen real quick to, the screen that has my little Mentimeter. I'm just going to present that. Okay, and then we're going to go back. Here we go. All right, this is my screen with the Mentimeter, guys. Uh, so, my first question is: Do you know? Um, do you use a water filter at home for drinking water? So, in your respective houses. Do you have a separate water filter? You're, so you're not drinking directly from the tap, but there's something that's cleaning the water that's coming from the tap. So I'll give just like maybe, all right, yes, we do. Okay, no, we don't. Cool. It's also okay if you don't know, this is anonymous. No one is tracking your name. So you can also say that. Okay, interesting. For the people who are saying, no, we don't, um, please feel free to type out which country are you joining here from? Where are you coming from? Would love to know. Yeah. Oh, it's two to two. It's almost, it's tied. Okay. Yes, we do. Who's saying, so who's saying they don't? Because I would love to live there. Who's saying they don't? All right. Yes, we do. Okay. So as you can see, as people are responding, more and more people are saying that they do use water water filtration systems um, to to uh, get drinking water. Um, this is just to show 
that, you know, actually a lot of um, countries, um, as, you know, especially Western countries as well, they don't have water filter systems at the end of their taps because there is, uh, because there are government protocols and there's actions and enforcement that make sure that the water that's coming through your tap is already safe to drink. Um, in some countries, that's not available everywhere. Only in cities are people able to get um, clean drinking water from their taps, but in other places, they have to use a water filter as the tap water comes out. If you're not sure, if you've never really thought about it, um, go home and check it out and see like, okay, do I have a filter? And see, uh, you know, and maybe you can look up the filter online and see what type of chemicals or what type of uh, materials they're using to filter the water that you're drinking at the end of the day. So yeah, four to three, okay, almost neck to neck. Very interesting, good. So let me go move on to the next question. Hopefully more people can join us as we go forward. This was that, next question. Okay, this is kind of a quiz. <laughs> it's okay if you don't know. Um, it's, it's a tough question. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. So what is the most common chemical added to water to make water more safe to drink? Does anybody know? Most common chemical. It's okay if you wanna guess anything. Any, you can just be like, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, I don't wanna give her the answer. Anybody want to take a stab at this? You can also write in the chat box if you'd like. It's true what Brian says. It's also, you can use a lot of nature-based solutions to also filter your water. Uh, you guys might've seen in some places, they have those huge water tanks in their, in their not huge, but big water tanks inside their kitchens. And you'll see at the bottom of the, there's multiple layers to the water tank and they have rocks and different soils and different pebbles. And that's also, that's a slow filtration system, but it's a very natural and sustainable one too. All right, six people have mentioned it. All right, let's see what they threw. Wow. I hope you guys didn't look it up. But if you did look it up, also really great because you learned something new. Well done. Yes, chlorine. Okay, water filter candles. I'd love to learn more about water filter candles. I'm not familiar with it, uh, but you know, I, I have a lot to learn. But chlorine, wonderful guys. So, so there's some basic uh, understanding here that uh, in the right amounts, chlorine is a very safe and impactful chemical to add to water to make it safe to drink. Cool, that was just like a little quiz. And then finally, last question, uh, open question. Is the quality of water affected by climate change? So what do you think? Do you think climate change affects the quality of water that we have? Hmm, lots of people saying yes, interesting. All right, four people, six people saying yes. Okay, yeah, we'll go with this. So yes, totally. Climate change has a huge impact on the quality of water that we are going to attain or that we're gonna have access to going forward. Um, does anyone wanna share? Maybe you can raise your hand. You can share why you think climate change affects. Uh, you can raise your hand and, and I'll, I can call on you if you wanna say it. You can also type in the chat box. I'd love to hear. All right, people are shy, but look, everyone's writing the right answer. So I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to see that people understand that there is a linkage between quality of water. Yeah, quality of water and, uh, and, and climate change. So fantastic. Good. So with that, I'm just going to switch back to our presentation. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this. So Causes of climate, chemical, and bacteriological contamination of water. So you guys kind of might know about some of these, but maybe not about all of these. So if you're thinking about groundwater and even surface water, um, obviously today's World Water Day, so we're thinking about groundwater mostly. There's a lot of different ways that your groundwater can get contaminated. Um, firstly, it's you know 
poor sanitation practices. So we, you know, Nirma and I, we work on um, sanitation as well, which is making sure that all households have toilets and also under sanitation is waste management in general, right? So you have plastics, you have um, industries leaking chemicals and um, effluents into water sources. You have gray water. So gray water is a water that comes out of washing your hands, um, taking showers, washing your clothes. All of this is considered waste and, and waste kind of falls under sanitation. All of this tends to go untreated into water supply. And when it does, all the chemicals are leaking out. If you have a plastic bag in, in a water source for a really long time, that plastic bag is going to seep chemicals as well into the water. And those chemicals are likely going to enter your body if, you, if it's not treated first. We also have uh, impacts because of climate change. So what happens when seawater starts coming in, right? Everybody knows that if there's low lying land and there's seawater that's coming in because we have melting glaciers, because we have rising sea levels, well, seawater, it's salty. Well, salty seawater, when it comes into the land, it starts sinking into our groundwater tables. And once our groundwater tables, which are usually fresh water and clean, uh, once they get salty, it's really hard to get that salt out which means it's very, very costly. Some countries are investing a lot in making sure that they have desalination plants, um, which take seawater or, or contaminated water and they try to remove the salt from, you know, the sodium and the chlorine from, uh, from uh, water sources, but it's very costly and it's usually seen as like the last solution. Um, we also have leaching from water supply components. So if you have pipelines for water supply, and uh, there's leaks in the pipeline. Well, if there's leaks in the pipeline, you know what happens when there's a lot of water on a surface? Well, it starts corroding, right? It starts rusts, rusting. If you start rusting the metal, the metal gets into the water as well. So that's why it's really important to always make sure that you're, uh, you're maintaining water supply systems regularly, that you're not letting the rust mix in with the water. You also have rock water, uh, sorry, geologic, uh, contam geological contamination. So everybody knows again, maybe you don't. And so I'm gonna tell you um, at the bottom, and this is, I think our other speakers have covered it. So groundwater tends to come from aquifers. Aquifers are these rocks that hold water. You often think of rocks as really hard, but they actually have like a lot of water inside. But what happens if you keep drilling deeper and deeper and deeper into the rock, it releases chemicals like arsenic and fluoride. Fluoride is in your toothpaste and in the right amount, fluoride is actually pretty safe. But if you are digging too deep into an aquifer, you're pulling all of the rock components out with the water, especially when there's not enough water, right? So something else will start coming out. And when you have fluoride and arsenic coming out, then you ingest a lot of fluoride and arsenic if it's not treated. And that creates a lot of health issues as well, which we'll talk about later. And then you also have pesticides and fertilizers, which comes from industry, which we've kind of spoken about. So there's lots of different ways that our groundwater can be contaminated. So if you're living in, a, if you're lucky enough to live in, you know, a country that has a lot of resources and has a lot of financing, where it can control all of these elements, uh, you know, it's it's so many moving pieces that have to be put in place to make sure that everybody has clean drinking water. And not all countries have this in place, but all countries are trying very hard to get here. So potential health risks of bacteria, right? So bacteria comes from human waste, solid waste, animal waste, uh, other sources of uh, animal pro byproducts. Um, so potential okay. health risks of bacteria, you can have you, you know, cholera. Uh, uh, one of uh, the great health, uh, public health advocates, Paul Farmer has recently died, but he has often described cholera as something that only really happens in countries that are poor because, because cholera is completely preventable. If you have enough money, if you have the right systems in place, you don't need, you won't have cholera in your country. You can also have diarrhea, hepatitis, dysentery, typhoid, polio. Polio we've eradicated, but in some pockets, oh, sorry, there's a, there's a unmuted mic somewhere. I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, polio we've eradicated, but there's always that risk of it coming back if we're not making sure that our water sources are staying clean. Um, and some of us have had this, you know, I've had diarrhea, 
I think when I was a child, because I grew up in India, I've had typhoid as well. And it was really, really painful. And, and no one, it's never, none of these are ever pleasant, right? Um, and so if we don't control the safety of our water supply, we then have to invest a lot more money going forward in finding cures to new diseases, right? So if we invest a little bit in prevention, you save a lot of money in finding cures as well. In terms of health risks, because of chemical contamination, so you have arsenic coats, you have arsenic, fluoride, nitrates, <clears throat> lots of other chemicals that get released into, nitrates come from fertilizers, from industrial waste, lots of chemicals that are going into our water sources. Um, I don't wanna to get too sad or too depressing about this, but you can, it can lead to a lot of serious internal organ failure. Um, you can have lung and kidney disease, you can have cancer, your heart, uh, you know, your heart is a very, very soft and, I mean, it's very hard and very uh, uh, resilient, but also when, it, when there's too many chemicals in your body, it's often highly affected. Uh, your neurological system is often the first to be affected by too many chemicals in your bodies. You can get diabetes, and then you can also have fluorosis or an arsenicosis, which both kind of affect the density of your bones. So you can have a lot of problems when it comes to um, osteoporosis and, and other, uh, bone related uh, issues later on in life. And we also need to prepare, you know, when we're thinking about investing in, uh, in making sure that our water supply is safe as governments, as citizens, individual citizens, as communities, we also need to make sure that we're preparing um, our plans while keeping climate shifts in mind too. So I'm just gonna share from the India example so that you guys can, can kind of understand. India has 35 states, 27 of them are now considered extremely vulnerable to hydrological disasters. The number of floods in India went from 67 uh, in between 1996 and 2005 to 90 in the 10-year peri period afterwards. And not only are there more floods, they're more intense and more damaging as we go on. And that means they're going to come more inland as well. Uh, Long-term future scenarios dominated by global uh, greenhouse gas increases suggest that Indian summer monsoon rainfall will increase. So if you have a lot of flooding and there's a lot of unmanaged waste, right? So if there's like a, if you're not, if communities are not using toilets, if they're not managing their solid waste properly and you have a lot of flooding coming, that flooding is going to start moving that waste around and contaminating more spaces, right? And then that means that more groundwater sources are going to be contaminated too. We also have an increase in frequency and severity of droughts over, and so when you have too many droughts, and if it's over places where people have drilled too deep, then that's just going to start releasing more and more chemicals from those aquifers, right? Because people are going to dr drill deeper and deeper and deeper, and if you drill deeper, 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 and you dry out an aquifer, often it's really hard for that aquifer to stay fresh and start getting more water again. Um, you have more intense heat waves of longer durations and occurring at higher frequency. And it's already projected that 40 million people in India are going to be at risk from rising sea levels. That's a lot of people. I mean, we know that India has 1.3 billion people, but 40 million is probably an underestimate as far as we, we, can, uh, we know. Uh, I do see that there's, yes, quality of pipes. Uh, Mohammed, I hope you heard all the reasons that I said for how, uh, you know, how climate change affects uh, affects water supply, but I'm happy to also talk about this later as well and reply in the chat. But just wanna give you an example of what UNICEF is doing in India to try to address this at a community and government level. So we're installing water filters and, and plants. So, you know, water treatment plants, uh, usually they're in cities, but we're also trying to figure out how to make sure that they're reaching rural communities as well so that there's central treatment systems so that you don't have to treat it individually at the household level. We're also making sure that we, when we are helping households and communities build and access toilets, that they're built at a safe distance from water sources under their feet and also from surface water like rivers and lakes. And we're also making sure that, you know, we are encouraging communities to use models that are safe and don't leak waste into the soil and groundwater. Um, we're also working with the government to make sure that we're improving people's access to water quality testing labs. So you don't really think about it, but actually in a lot of countries that have clean drinking water, there are water quality testing labs that are day and night testing that water constantly to make sure that it is still safe to drink on Tuesday and that it's still safe to drink on next Tuesday and still safe to drink next month. 
So this is a regular routine system that needs to be in place in all countries. And so in India, they're investing in this a lot right now. And so UNICEF is also helping by training, uh, training the labs, the lab workers on what water quality testing needs to be, what the standards are. And so we're really hoping that with enough water quality testing labs in place that have been accredited, then you have communities with more options for where they send their water, uh, where they send their water, um, water to be tested as well and get, get responses faster as well. And then finally, liquid waste management. So we talked about solid waste management. So that's also part of it. But one thing that we're really focusing on in the coming years is gray water management. Think about how much water comes out of your house every day when everyone has showered, everyone has washed the dishes, all your clothes are watered, uh, sorry, all your clothes are washed, not watered, and uh, making sure that uh, what else? Yeah, like your hands are washed as well that, you know, the the water that you use to make food, but maybe you don't drink, so you tip it into the sink. Every single day, you know, hundreds of liters are coming out of your wa house that are gray water that could be reused only if it was treated properly. So think about that for India, where you have 1.3 billion people generating gray water every single day. There's a lot of opportunity to conserve that water, right? Once you treat it, then you can reuse it. And if you're reusing that water, then you let, then you don't put so much stress on the water in the ground, right? Because you're able to reuse treated water that's already out there. So that's something that we're really, we're working hard on right now with the government to see how we can put some uh, low cost technological adaptations in place. And we're also making sure that, uh, that uh, and one technology, approach is a soak pit, uh, usually built into the ground. It's kind of, sometimes it's a chamber, sometimes it's more natural. It's like layers of rocks and other sediments. And what happens is that the gray water goes into the soak pit and there's a, there's a level of the soak pit where the gray water is filtrated so that a bacteria is removed from the gray water and other large um, elements of it. And then there could be another filtration level to make sure that some chemical um, cleaning is also done before the water goes back into the ground. And so that's all, that's a key technology that's being pushed in India right now through its national missions. But yes, that's what the government can do, right? But it's like, okay, what can youth also do? So for World Water Day, we did come up with a few suggestions and a few recommendations, and we put it in the form of a digital quiz or survey. Everybody is welcome to take it. Uh, and it's, it's uh, if you have WhatsApp, that's the easiest way to take it. You can also do it over Facebook Messenger. But on WhatsApp, if you WhatsApp this number and you type in WWD, then the quiz or the survey will pop up. And we'd love for everybody to take it. Um, we'd love to know your thoughts see what you learned about uh, water pollution right now. And also um, you can access it to see what some suggestions are for what you can do at your home. Another big thing that you guys can do is obviously, you know, talk to your family and friends, um, check out the water filtration system in your house. What is it using? Do you have one? If you don't have one, who's testing your water? Why do you trust it, right? Sometimes you trust it because you trust your government and sometimes you trust it because you've never gotten sick. So it's a great, conversational topic to have with your family, with your friends, with your siblings, just to better understand, you know, and appreciate the water that's coming into your house and how you're using it too. And obviously everybody can do their part in conserving water. There's a lot of water budgeting applications, mobile applications out there where you can check your um, water footprint. Uh, you know, if you take a shower that's five minutes instead of 10 minutes, you can save, you know, about a hundred gal hundred liters of water. Um, depending on how much water comes out of your shower every minute. So if you add that up over the course of a month, you literally are saving enough water for another family to use. Um, and then finally, I would say consider career in water and sanitation sectors. Many countries don't have enough professionals in this sector. And what we really, what we all need are trained professional and professionalized and passionate, uh, yeah, passionate academics, journalists, artists, storytellers. You could also be a wash specialist like me. I'm not like, I'm not the, the technical expert, but I'm here to advocate for other people to become technical experts on my behalf. You can become a water quality lab scientist, a hydrological engineer. All of these would be considered also green jobs because you're helping promote efficiency of the use of natural resources as well. Um, and so if we can make a more green economy going forward and you guys can join it, I think that'll be maybe the most impactful thing that um, we can do as a society together.
Uh, we have a lot of other um, ideas and opportunities, but maybe uh, I'll stop now and uh, open the floor for questions from people and, and maybe any reflections that you also have. Um, but yes, thank you for listening to me and I, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Please, please at first, uh, how can I, uh, I access to this, these uh, presentations that, uh, at, uh, that um, I seen in this uh, conference? Yes, I believe John Lee had said that um, he will share all of them. So I think if you've registered as a participant, I'm sure he has your email address and can, can share them. He has a copy of this. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, John Lee, I think your internet is... Hello, <laughs> sorry. Hey, John Lee, uh, if you can uh, just turn off your video and then talk without a video, maybe it will be works with you. Yes, yes, I think so too. Um, thank you for your we should be very happy to respond to you. Okay, okay. Miss, you have some questions in the chat box? Yeah, so there is a question in the chat. And let me, sorry, I will just start facilitating. Uh, so Fai has asked, how can we detect underground water? Is there any traditional knowledge in detecting underground water? Yes, uh, so I am not the specialist on this. I think the speakers before me are much more knowledgeable in this area, but I do know that um, usually what governments have are these specific strategic wells that they dig into different places that they think um, have aquifers. So a good way to detect aquifers is, you know, if you're near a river, or near ocean or sea, you know, a, a sea or lake, um, it's probably a lot of groundwater nearby underneath. And so you can dig some of these wells strategically and you can dig them uh, at a level, so you can dig them deep enough so that the water is released from underneath into the well. And that also because of the pressure uh, that, you know, that the water comes up with as well, I think, <laughs> is how you can also just, uh, you can also figure out how much water there is underneath too. There's a lot more science that goes into it, uh, but I'm happy to see if I can find a link that explains it better than I did. And actually, I'm um, sorry, just to say uh, the way that over time, over decades, over years, um, you can see if groundwater is going down is because of these wells, right? So you go revisit these wells every year. You can check the quality of the water in these wells, and you can also check the level of the water in the well as well. And so, you know, in places that they say experience a lot of drought or there's a lot of water stress, um, you know, scientists have seen that the water levels in these wells have slowly, slowly gone down over time. So it is, um, it is quite concerning. Uh, Yoko, over, over to you again. Yeah, thank you. And then there's more like more other questions. Um, like, I think we should move on <laughs> actually with the speaker, but I guess I'll can leave for five more minutes. Uh, yeah, but there's like so many questions in the chat though. Can we maybe leave that for the discussion? Jessica, what do you think? 
Yes, go Yoko, thank you so much. And yes, we can definitely save some for the discussion. We also have discussion prompts to guide us through the discussions. And we can definitely save some of these questions from the chat box to incorporate it into our discussion. And we can go over and then afterwards we'll have a breathing session when we come back to the main room and we can all talk about the findings and discoveries that we have. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't unmute myself, sorry. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Just, um, uh, just go and share your screen. Okay, great, thank you so much. And I see that uh, Zhongli is uh, coming back too. So I will be sharing the slides for Yoko's uh, presentation. And Yoko, thank you so much for coming and uh, presenting as well. And thank you so much to the three speakers before Yoko for presenting on this very important topic. Uh, sorry, Jessica. Uh, Virginia will be before me if you look at the message. Yeah, Virginia will talk in nine minutes according to our conversation. I think I will leave it to Virginia. Oh, okay. Okay, then. Yeah, so we can continue with the discussion. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know if the speakers are here, but we can continue the discussion until our Virginia comes here. The next speaker comes. And yeah, so the next question is, da -da -da -da, if I'm reading the chat. I don't know if, and I, and I understand this question, but how PACA work to cause this effect on the groundwater? Is that for our speaker, Miss Rathi? Asif? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm so sorry. Did I miss something? It's okay, but I don't... Okay, so one of the questions in the chat mm -hmm. is how PACA was of course this effect on underground water? I don't... I don't know what that um, I'm from. sorry. Uh, Asif, I don't know what PACA water courses means. Maybe you can uh, unmute and, and, and speak as well. But if, if in general you're talking about... Uh, uh, actually, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Maybe ask if you if you'd like to unmute and and, and let me know what you're saying. Cemented water courses. Interesting. Uh, I am not sure. Um, I, but I'm happy to look it up and and see if I can figure out the answer after this um, after this presentation. But thank you for asking this. Okay, um, I just realized something, sorry. Yeah, I mean, we can just say the comments in the chat based on your converse, uh, your presentation. So like, uh, so what, I mean, so Josephine has commented. So you might, I mean, I guess this is for the Malawi Power uh, President, I think, or any other speakers is that, so among indigenous people in Malawi, they are also about to know the availability availability of groundwater just by the presence of particular tree species and types. Enoma has said areas where water is at sur the surface as springs, seeps, swamps, or lakes reflect the presence of groundwater, although not necessary in large quantities or of usable quality. And then, yeah, I, yeah, Sivati, has also commented. Lots of nature-based knowledge should also be used. Yeah, I mean, yes. So if you can continue with your comments and any of this chat, please feel free to comment, Swati. Or any other, anyone else who want to ask questions, please feel free to ask questions as well. Yes, yes, please do. Um, and yeah, you're also welcome to find me on LinkedIn uh, and uh, you know, we can network and there's a lot of other uh, professionals who work in the water sector. There's just so much knowledge out there. I know incredibly little compared to so many other people who've been working here for decades. So I encourage all everyone to Google, to learn more, read more about water quality and um, yeah. And if you have a passion for it, please, please do join the sector. Thank you. Thanks, Yoko. 
Okay. Thank you. About the other question, you can ask them directly in the chat. Now we are going to pursue with the activity. Now we'll have to about, about diversity in water. Dr. Edne, you can talk. Hi, can you hear me? Hello, you Hello? can talk. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, actually, I will let my camera off because my internet connection is so, so bad. And then um, I will cut my presentation too because um, the time was uh, 11.25 and now we are over time. I have, I have other things to do before this presentation. My schedule is so... Perfect. And let me present myself. First of all, uh, I am Edle Jamini. I am from AD. Uh, I'm agronomist with emphasis on environmental management and resources, natural. And I have a master degree on uh, ecology and natural management resources from the Federal University of Africa. And now I'm current doctorate student in ecology and biodiversity conservation at the Federal University of uh, Mato Grosso. It's on other Brazilian state. I currently work with remote sensing to uh, map uh, wetland on Pantanal in Brazil. And the Pantanal is the more largest wetland in the world. And it's a pleasure to me to to discuss about the water and the biodiversity uh, with you today. And then let, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, let's begin by a question. Uh, how much is there on, in, and the water above the world, above the earth? It's a question to, to think about and to, to have an idea about the importance of water on the world. Um, basically, the earth is a watery place, but just how much water is exist on in and above our planet? That's the question. To respond it, uh, we know about eleven. We know about um, seventy one percent of the Earth's surface is water, covered, and the ocean holds about. Uh, 96.5% of all F water. Water also exists in the air as vapor, in the river and lakes, and ice caps and glacier in the ground as oil moisture and the aquifer, and even in your even in you and your dog. Water is never siding still. Uh, thanks to the water cycle, our planet water supply is constantly moving from one place to another place and from one form to another form. Things will get pretty set without the water cycle. Uh, 
Uh, the question is, where is F water locality? And the detailed explanation of where F is locked at the data in the figure below. In this figure, you can see, you can notice all of the world total water supply about the uh, about uh, nine percent, ninety six point five percent in the ocean, and only two point five percent is fresh water, and there is uh, other saline water too that we can we can't explore, and the fresh water. There is a, a repetition about a glacier, groundwater, surface water, and this uh, and this you the the atmosphere and evapotranspiration contribute a lot of for this. And we will speak about the water cycle, fundamental of the water cycle, because the water on the wolf generally is recycled and never lost. And on this figure, you can see the process of the water cycle. There is um, basically uh, evaporation and evapotranspiration. Um, condensation, cloud process, and precipitation, and after infiltration, and we continue this process. And as you know, there is more water at the ocean level than continental level. Considering the water cycle process, there will be water anyway on the earth. There is no doubt about this. However, what is the the scale, the effort is the de decrease in fresh water because to have fresh water, it's necessary to have forest ecosystem and forest precipitation at two level and the recycling of water to evapotranspiration and water infiltration during the rain, the rain process. It means So just, you just. So it means the water on the, the fresh water in the cycle, water is important for the biodiversity. Without the forest, there is no um, biodiversity. There is no life on the continental level. And you know, uh, that the importance of, of uh, forest for the biodiversity, if there is no forest, if the deforestation process is more important than uh, regeneration, there is no biodiversity. And then I will not uh, speak uh, a lot about the, the process and the evaporation uh, process. I know certainly you know a lot of things about this. I will speak more about the, the wetland. It's another ecosystem which is important for uh, the biodiversity. And there is, um, there is no more, no person speak about the, the, the wetland. According to the RANSA Convention, the Ransa Convention is in the Convention which uh, was organized in the Ransa. Uh, it's a Iranian city. Wetlands are areas of marsh, fence, peatland, 
or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing, fresh, blackfish or salt, including areas of marine water, the, of the depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. Um, fish pond rise, ponding depolution, depolution, and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and started vision ponds and salt one human made wetland. Uh, wetland are vital for humans, for other ecosystem, and for our climate. Wetland providing essential ecosystem services such as water regulation, including flood control and water purification. Wetland biodiversity matters for all health, all food supply, for tourism, and even for jobs. Wetland also absorb carbon dioxide, so helps slow global heating and reduce pollution, hence have often between effort. Uh, Fifth, they, they cover the wetland cover around uh, six percent of the earth land surface. Um, Forty percent of all plant animal species live or breed in the wetland. The worrying things is the that they are disappearing trees three times faster than forests due to human activities and global heating. Wetland are fantastic or valuable multifunctional habitats for birds and other species. And wetland are various ecosystems. They nurture a great diversity of life, provide water and other resources, protect us from flooding, and act as geo filter. filter is in pollution. The loss of wetland due to development pressure has been enormous, but the ecosystem can be restored to regenerate benefit for people and nature. And then the, the two uh, ecosystem, forest and wetland, is very important for water conservation, and mainly forest is the key for bombing water on the wetland. And in Amazonia, for example, uh, it served as a bomb, bombing to uh, evaporate water on the atmosphere to contribute on the rain process on the South America region. And if I would, if I would be the Amazonian forest, the region of Sao Paulo, the soft region of Brazil and South America will not have uh, oil and will not have uh, agricultural activities and biodiversity life. Without the, this ecosystem, there will be uh, not reasons of uh, life, animal life and other digital species. And I will not speak about the, the, the marine biodiversity because it's too large. And I know um, there is a other person which will speak about this, this term. And uh, it's all about what I, I have to, to discuss with you about the water and biodiversity. For a question, I will. Uh, disponible. I have 10 minutes to discuss with you. And uh, it's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Idlin, for your presentation. Now we can take only one question because the time is going now. 
if you have any question, you can ask directly. Uh, in the chat box so that um, we can. Okay, so if you don't have questions, we'll go directly to the next presentation. We'll hear Mrs. Virginia Balchesi. She, she goes for all presentation. Happy to have you here. The floor is for you now. Thank you very much. I'm going to share um, my screen uh, for in a second. Just I, if you will let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Can everyone see? Just let me know. Yes, all good, Virginia. Thank you. Okay, amazing. Um, so. My name is Virginia, uh, as was said before, and I um, am a, a youth activist um, and youth advisor um, working in the, the field of inclusion of international, um, international development and international affairs, um, of, for the inclusion of young people in the field of uh, international affairs. And um, my experience is mainly uh, with like two huge organizations. I worked with the UN and specifically um, UNICEF um, uh, in the Central Asia and uh, Europe office as a youth advocate and then currently I sit in an advisory board, um, the Youth Sounding Board for U US International Partnerships, where I advise the EU Commissioner on International Partnerships, so development, Jutta Urpilainen, on um, issues that pertain to youth inclusion in EU's development policies. So that's um, a little bit about what I do. And specifically, I wanted to, like my intervention today, it's going to be about how young people can be included in climate action and um, some of my experiences in the field of inclusion of young people in climate action um, and some of the like institutional mechanism mechanisms that can allow young people to be included in, in that very important uh, international policy making field. Um, I'm just going to leave, I don't know if my presentation is going to be um, shared uh, with the participants, but I'm going, uh, maybe after I can leave in the chat, uh, the links that I will just share in my presentation so that everyone can go and look at some of those initiatives that I think can be useful for all of us, that for all of us interested in the field of uh, youth engagement. Um, so, uh, if we move on to the next slide, uh, if you, cool. So um, the um, inclusion of young people in, in, uh, in international climate action negotiations and climate action policies is particularly important. Uh, we know that young people have been particularly active in this field, especially at the local and grassroots level, organizing protests, uh, organizing uh, different kinds of um, grassroots engagement to make <laughs> leaders aware of um, how much we care about climate action and how much uh, we it is at stake when it comes about um, climate action. Um, if we ever uh, wonder why we should also be engaged in the policy making process. So not just when like going on the streets and manifesting, but also why we should be engaged in the process that comes with, you know, negotiating and finding policy solutions, et cetera. Um, we, um, there's two main reasons. The first one is that um, it is well, where negotiations and policy making happens, that's where uh, the real solutions and the real policies and um, the real decisions are going to be taken. So if we want to be part of those decisions, if we want to be part of um, things that are um, going to actually make a change, then we have to be part of the conversations that happen at the negotiation table and um, among decision makers. And then um, we are also part of um, the stakeholders 
that should be engaged in those negotiations, in those decisions, because it's not about um, you know, someone else. It's actually about us. It's about us and it's about our future. And very often it's much more about us than it is about um, the people that are actually, um, since it's, uh, you know, it's going to have a huge impact on our own future, than it is about the people that are actually sitting in those um, meetings and in those negotiation, uh, negotiation rooms. So that's why we should get engaged um, and we should do it at the international level. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the organization that I'm part of have done, are doing in order to include those youth voices in the debate surrounding climate policies. Um, and uh, specifically, um, there's uh, different layers of action that can be, that we can take. Um, like I'm going to first look at what UNICEF has, has been doing. I'm sure many of you know, many of you might be as well engaged with UNICEF in this field, in this field. but um, there's um, different types of actions that UNICEF has been carrying on. There's on the one hand, um, the component of um, allowing young people to share their perspective, share their opinion, form their opinion, and very often also influence um, public uh, opinion on certain issues by, for example, writing articles, um, writing op-eds, and just uh, like sharing com like communication materials in general. And there's a lot of ways that we can help the public debate going towards being more climate friendly and more supportive of climate policies that are uh, going to better serve our future. Um, and that yeah, UNICEF is trying to use both. One of them is actually writing um, articles, insights on issues that uh, pertain uh, to, to this, um, to this uh, like um, policy uh, problem um, on different platforms, but namely um, a platform that UNICEF uses is Voices of Youth, um, which is, uh, I can leave the link below, but basically anyone who has something to say about an issue that's close to their heart, they can go and write a, a blog post um, for UNICEF uh, on Voices of Youth, and they can share their opinion, they can share, uh, we can all share um, our ideas and help also form an opinion uh, through a communication and through um, sharing um, our perspectives. And then another uh, way uh, to influence public debate and public opinion is by making our voices heard. And in order to make our voices heard, at times we have to use big numbers. So what UNICEF does very often uh, to hear what young people have to say and to hear what a lot of young people have to say, there's um, a very useful tool that's called you report. I'm also going to link that in the chat later. Um, that's basically um, a mobile uh, tool, a mobile platform where everyone can, basically everyone can sign up on this platform. And what happens is that UNICEF will send out a lot of surveys um, on issues that are very important uh, to like our generation, are very important to the public debate, and people can share their opinion. A lot of people, like we're talking about millions of people can share their opinions. And so all of that then informs reports and communication materials and um, negotiation positions. And so like the, the, the big number helps create a, a stand, helps create um, a, a perspective, helps, helps create a position that then um, UNICEF can use um, when engaging young people uh, and including young people in international decision making. And then uh, there's another way, another pathway, which is uh, creating, organizing meetings and exchanges with the policymakers, the people that are actually taking those decisions. Um, for example, during the UN Climate Summit, many of you might have gone as well. Um, it, like those huge international summits are uh, occasions where you can meet with leaders, talk to leaders, exchange with them and kind of like lobby um, and push for your, your ideas and push for your the policies that you want to see implemented. And then the conf conferences of the parties um, and like, uh, there's a lot of like in, in youth engagement mechanisms related to uh, the conference of the par conferences of the parties, and there's also intercontinental or intracontinental summits that are also usually they also usually have a pillar uh, around climate action, and they're also very important advocacy events for young people to go and shape a leaders' opinion. 
And uh, what um, I wanted to share is specifically uh, my experience very recently going to the EU Africa Summit um, with UNICEF. Um, we were um, lucky enough to be able to have um, dedicated to yeah, like um, a whole youth day and that's a youth track of the whole summit dedicated specifically to um, to young people. So a whole um, like document, a negotiated document, a whole communique was specifically dedicated to young people's ideas on a lot of different issues, but specifically also about climate change. And so part of the uh, EU Africa Summit was actually like a week was all dedicated to um, bringing together a lot of different inputs, like having a lot of different, different events and then trying to create a document that could be of influence um, to policymakers that would come together during the weekend. And so what UNICEF has done, they've organized um, a, um, the youth climate, a youth climate action event that I had the, the privilege to moderate, where a lot of different youth advocates that have a lot to say about climate change coming from all over the world, specifically from um, uh, different countries in Africa um, and a couple of countries in the EU have come together and um, shared their ideas and their perspectives on um, climate policies and climate action. And also they have shared, um, engaged in talks with um, policymakers that came to the event to share their opinions and especially to listen to young people. We had um, a minister, the Minister of Water Resources from Nigeria. We had Minister of the Environment of Bulgaria. Uh, we had a lot of different um, high level um, uh, policymakers. We had um, the, the Minister of Youth of Senegal, like a lot of different policymakers that came and exchanged with young people uh, during the event. And then the outcomes of uh, this event uh, and other events on climate action and other issues then were channeled into a policy document that was then presented to leaders at the council meeting. And then um, during those events, there's usually always also the chance to exchange uh, with, as I said, as I mentioned, uh, with policymakers and decision makers, very high level policymakers and decision makers. Um, and notably, we had the chance to interact and talk about climate, uh, some, some climate issues um, in the Sahel with um, the special representative for the Sahel of the EU, uh, Emanuela de Re. And then we had the chance also to talk to the Italian Minister for Development, Marina Sereni, um, and exchange on different uh, climate policies that um, the EU Africa partnership should um, should put in place uh, and should uh, should have adopted at the time of the summit. So going to this summit was particularly useful because it gave us the the the, the, the space to talk to those leaders and um, and have uh, have a, have our voices actually heard. And then um, I wanted to uh, lastly. Uh, briefly um, mention uh, the work of the European sound, uh, Youth Sounding Board for Youth International Partnerships and International Development. Um, yeah, like our, the, the engagement of these other youth engage, like youth institutional youth engagement mechanisms that I'm part of. Um, as I mentioned before, the Youth Sounding Board is uh, an advisory board to uh, the, um, the um, Commissioner for International uh, Partnerships, so development, Jutta Urpilainen. And what we're doing at this time is uh, we are developing um, an action plan that is going to be like uh, together with a lot of other stakeholders, namely member states and different youth organizations, but an action plan that is going to be a blueprint for EU, um, EU's external action um, and EU foreign affairs um, and specifically the inclusion of youth in um, all in development policy planning. And so in, in the development of this uh, action plan, we have um, climate is of course one of the climate action, climate policies is of course one of the pillars, one of the crucial pillars of the agenda and of the action plan. And so we have conducted a lot of different consultations with actors on the ground, specifically a lot of youth organizations that work um, on climate policies on the ground and we've had the chance to exchange also with many of them at COP26. And it was particularly um, relevant for us to also hear um, what are their challenges and like what are the difficulties of um, that they're facing when it comes to uh, putting in place 
um, you know, climate action and what do they need from an international development actor such as the EU to support them in those um, endeavors. And then uh, we uh, had the privilege also to organize a side event at COP26 on um, youth climate action, youth and climate action again. Um, and we organized that with um, uh, some other young people um, that work with um, the European Climate Pact. So in EU Clima and um, that are like very relevant stakeholders uh, in the youth, institutional youth field uh, in the domain of climate action and climate policies. And we have organized an event where young people from the climate, the, the European Climate Pact and young people from who have a very like climate oriented perspective and then young people from the youth sounding board. So uh, who have a more, let's say development oriented perspective to come together and exchange their views on uh, what policies should be implemented uh, at COP by leaders to, um, to implement climate action. And, um, and uh, so yeah, we had like, a, like outcomes then um, were then presented to negotiators and that will be continued to advocate for also um, as we approach to the next COP. Um, yeah, next year in Egypt. So those are some of the things that I wanted to share with you, but I'm very happy to have like an interactive uh, moment if any of you wants to ask any question about what I've just said and about like the perspectives I've tried to share with the organizations that I've, I, I wanted to highlight. I'm very happy to have an exchange. Yeah, Jessica. Virginia, I just want to say thank you so much for your wonderful presentation about youth action and also on participation. And uh, I am very much interested in UNICEF uh, because I myself, I am a volunteer member of UNICEF. And I do, yeah, and it's super happy to see somebody from UNICEF actually presenting. And it would be so great um, to, because I know uh, water is actually one of the uh, priorities that UNICEF has been involving in. For example, um, partnering with other organizations or getting directly involved in water projects. And so um, if you can, perhaps you can uh, give us some insight on how youth participation and action can be incorporated while we are perhaps at the local levels where we're uh, you know, already familiar with the locality of the projects. And, uh, or even if we're like international uh, citizens. And so uh, from your perspective, how we can better able to incorporate ourselves into uh, the global work here? Um, that's a very good question. I think this is one of the main challenges because like bridging global and local is one of the huge challenges that that we all have, I think. Um, for me, um, like, like, um, like, I think UNICEF has like a good recipe in the sense. Um, I don't know where you, um, where you're volunteering, but originally I'm Italian, so I'm volunteering in Italy. Um, I had the opportunity to, on the one hand, be like a spokesperson for young people and like kind of like a youth advocate working at the international level. But then on the other side, I was doing a lot of field work, and specifically in my past, I have like. Uh, my expertise is on um, migrant and refugee youth in Italy. So I worked with a, um, a lot of young people that lived in asylum seeker centers and try to like, like I worked with them at the grassroots level. And so UNICEF really gave me the chance to do both things at, um, at the same time. I think there's, um, the thing is that um, in order to understand those problems, we want to have a global perspective, but then we also want to be able to recognize them at the local level, be able to see them when we have them in front of our eyes and then go and, um, and, and take action. And taking action can mean a lot of different things, but, and of course it's different for every community, but it can go from like sharing when it comes to water, for example, I think there's a lot of like lack of information and a lot of lack of awareness related to water scarcity and water resources in a lot of in a lot of places around the world. So even like um, communicating those issues um, from someone who has a, a local perspective um, and or then um, having like awareness raising talks in schools, that's already 
amazing, amazing, amazing grassroots local work that every one of us can do in our free time as volunteers. Uh, and they can link in a way our global understanding of an issue and then our local action to try and change things. I hope that was an answer. Great, thank you so much for the emphasis on the importance of youth participation and also youth involvement. And I myself have gained so much insight on how I can better able to incorporate myself and also how I'm able to uh, seek solutions while also participating and engaging in, this, in these uh, very insightful discussions and forums and conferences. So I just wanna thank you so much, Virginia, for coming yeah, and presenting. Thank you. thank you. I don't know if Ahmed has a uh and raised yeah yeah go ahead actually i don't have a question but actually i want to second uh, about the youth uh, participation and to the international uh, conferences and especially uh, during the uh, uh, during the negotiations it's very important to having the youth uh, on the table of the negotiations because you want to be there you want to just to be heard from the leaders of, and from the whole of the stakeholder i want to share my i want to share my experience uh, during the unia 5 when i just having my intervention uh, during uh, the unia 5 and to the cluster uh, to into the lake uh, uh, sustainable lake management of, from coming from Indonesia government, and after just I made my intervention the second day, they just putting my points and the youth points into their draft resolution. So that means they are actually hearing us. So don't lose the hope. No, at uh, no at all, and also before the cup, there uh, there will be the CPs, and uh, the CPs will going to having like a negotiation table to shaving the cup uh, into the Egypt. So I second her in every word that she said, and I support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Bachesi, for your presentation. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Well, very happy to have you here. So, if okay, <laughs> now we are going to, if others ask a question, we can feel free to ask her in the chat box so that she will be very happy to respond to you. Now we're going to have all our speakers, um, Miss Yoko, Yoko Lee from Yongo. She wants to talk about yeah. Oh yeah, just go share the screen for me. So yeah, just wait for the screen to be shared. Well, so I am going to perhaps, let me see. Okay, just a moment. So I'm going to see if, um, Johnny, are you able to share your goals? Your um, goals are present. I can, yeah. Okay, I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to share it now. Oh, okay, great, thank you.
You can make it. It's okay. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. I'm hoping your internet is good. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I will. I will just start. I'm hoping I can finish like quickly. So my name is Yoko Ru. I am actually from Canada, but in Japan right now, and I am an environmental science with a master's degree in law, environmental science. And I have many interest and curious in many things. And then just, I mean, many initiatives. Yeah, I am not really, I'm not going to specify it, which organizations I am. But if you want to know me more, you can always look me up on LinkedIn and just connect with me and such. I mean, my name is really un uncommon. It's very really easy to find me. If you just put my name and just put development, you can it's just really easy to find me. Yeah. Yeah, continue on. Uh, yeah, uh, next slide, please. I mean, I will uh, introduce the climate action pathway in detail later. So I will start with the more general things in the beginning. Yeah, uh, please continue on the uh, next slide. Johnny. Johnny, are you, are you there? Hmm. Yes. Can you yes, go to the next slide? What? Okay. Um, I will maybe ask someone else to share the screen for me. Okay. Sarah, uh, are you here? Uh, Ahmed, are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I will share the screen. Uh, I'll right, share the link with you. Okay. Sorry for inconvenience. Did you send it into WhatsApp or where? No, because I, I, I didn't expect to share the screen. So yes. Okay, here's the, yeah, I just sent you the link now. Okay. Thank you, Ahmed. I'm glad you're here. It's still here. It's been a long time. I'm saving the, the life, as usual. <laughs> I mean, don't worry, Wait. people. We will make this event shorter next time. So people will not sit here the entire time. Sorry, people, but thank you for being here for this okay, event. Wait. Just loading your presentation. Okay, I'm ready to share. Okay. You can go, Yoko. Thank you. I will just introduce myself just because I feel like that's interrupted. <laughs> so my name is Yoko. So my name is Yoko. I am from Canada, but in Japan right now. I am in different organizations. I mean, I guess I can set uh, the system. So I am in Yango, of course. Then I am in Global Youth Biodiversity Network, Global Climate Youth Network, like Sustainable Ocean Alliance, like many others. So I'm an environmental scientist who is curious about many things. And I am just here to introduce into climate action pathway. I mean, I will introduce about topic more detail. I will start from the general information. Namit, mm -hmm. please continue. Yep. Thank you. So to start the topic, I will start intro like, introduce really briefly about the United Nations decade on ecosystem rest restoration. This United Nations decade on ecosystem ecosystem restoration is a very really, uh law theme program for well, like a decade between 2021 and 2030. So the different, so it's about a global running a cry to heal our planet. What will you restore? And that is for the website. So basically, in a nutshell, it's basically addresses the poverty issues, climate change, and biodiversity like mass extinction, mass extinction issues. And by having this ecosystem restoration, uh, basically the aim is to prevent, halt, and reverse the Ecosystem degradation globally. Yeah, continue. So these are just some pictures I gathered that really reflect the ecosystem restoration decade. So I am hungry. The, the page on the left is about poverty. The one on the top right is about 
the the nature and connections to water and also infrastructure for human enjoyment in the nature. And then there's energy panel in the middle of the waters for energy source. And this of, then there's education for the children. You know? oh, so basically these are all like SDGs, like SDG 2 is zero hunger, SDG 15 life on land, SDG STEM affordable and clean energy and SDG for quality education. And this and again is the SDG 6 clean water and sanitation and SDG 5 gender equality. Back, back, Ahmed. So basically, yeah, you can, you can stop there. Yeah. So really, it really highlights all the SDGs into one box. So everything's collect, collected. We cannot really separate and only talk about one SDG goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anyone? So now when it comes to the water, there is something called water action decade, which is a different time frame than the UN ocean, de ocean uh, ecosystem restoration by only like two years difference or three years. And so what action decade? Uh, so it's between 2018 and 2028. Go back, Ahmed. Uh, so there are these are three points. So one is advanced sustainable development, energize existing programs and projects, and find an inspired action to achieve the 2030 agenda. So, so this water action decade was established during the UN General Assembly in December 2016. So this decade was started on the World Water Day, which is today, but four, four years ago, on March 22nd, 2018, and will be will ended on March 22, 22nd, in 2028. Mm -hmm. Next. Yeah, thank you, continue. So finally, when it comes to the water in the UNFCCC framework, the United Nations Framework Commission on Climate Change. So this is under the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action. So Marrakesh is Morocco, and it was started all in like Morocco. So in the Marrakesh, for the Marrakesh Partnership for the Global Climate Action, it supports the implementation of the Paris Agreement by enabling collaboration between governments and the cities, regions, businesses, and investors that must act on climate change. So World Business Council for Sustainable Development endorses this action. So I highlighted some important terms from the, web, the, from the website, the summary, and which is like in the next slide. Yeah, thank you. So they have three reports since 2019 that's now on the website. So I am using the most recent report on climate action pathway for water. And so this is, these are the highlights I put into this Excel sheet, like the key terms. So as you see that these are very tied to the HDGs, as I mentioned before. I made back, back please, previous page. Yeah, thank you. So basically the renewable energy, ecosystem, agriculture, and food technology are just uh, really connected to the SDGs. And then for water, you also mentioned that the framework, the pathway really address the extract, store, deliver, use, treat, and reuse water. So this is really tied to the sustainable water use and access to water in our daily livelihood. And of course, it's all, all about net zero towards net zero. And again, so all of these are very tied to each other, but of course we really need to incorporate business trade and financial decisions because without those, we don't have the resources to protect and improve our life. 
including water, and it must be cross sectoral, institutional, institutional, let go and regulatory frameworks and resources, and civil society organizations. So, without civil society organizations, we really need to work from bottom to top approach so that everyone can be included. I mean, I mean, there's something lacking in this document, as you see. They don't have, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't really actually have the use. Uh, in the document, so that's kind of something that really needs to be improved in this the woman and gender and vulnerable communities and vice versa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Continue. Yeah, so to continue with this uh, report, so there is something called system transformation summary, which is the second part of this document. So this is more like how like really talks about the, the problem and how we can improve the situation. So yeah, so basically it also includes that the global climate mitigation is very important and because water management and protection of fresh water ecosystem, like we really need those in our lives to have a sustainable livelihood and healthy lives to sustain our lives without general hunger or have a really quality life. And there's also, and then there's that the frequency intensity of natural disasters are very, like really damage our environment and our houses can be damaged, including our ecosystem, like our environment is like damaged. So therefore we really cannot live without a proper adaptation and medication for climate change if we don't look at uh, doing something towards climate change. And the water is just one sector of that climate change. And we really need to work towards the climate resilience. For example, the many protected areas can be for like improved for climate resilience. And therefore it's really, it's the time to look at this, all these problems and get engaged. Mm. Yeah, continue on. So uh, uh, to continue, so with the policy regulations, and this, these are on the website. I mean, if you just look at this climate action pathway for water and the UMCC, you can find it. So, so, they, so there is this recommendation that they have on the website. I only put like short, like quoted and like really short portions on, in this PowerPoint. So people will know like what they really address in the document and to see what issues we have. So for example, so, so policy regulations have to be at all levels, including local, national, international. So I'm just gonna read the recommendations they have. So, for, so they have like six recommendations, the key, key recommendations. So one is ensuring sustainable, universal and fair access to water, sanitation and hygiene through just and inclusive water governance. Second, protecting water resources and fresh water ecosystems and halting and reversing the degradation and enabling large scale restoration of critical wetland systems. Third, reallocating water towards society's most essential needs, including for populations most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And they also really highlight the vulnerable populations. But then they also had to define we really need to define the vulnerable, vulnerable, communication, uh, vulnerable populations at the social ecological context. Fourth, implementing policies that enable the compete and net zero treatment, reuse and recycling of wastewater. Five, building and enabling environment that encourages system scale planning and actively plans for sustainable renewable energy options. And lastly, six, preventing preparing for responding to what related humanitarian disasters and post-disaster rehabilitation. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm reading all of these things from policy. It may sound technical, and it is technical, but from the perspective of children and youth, what, what can we really do about it? So, as a, so it's like something about making youth, youth consultations, for example, can really engage these children and youth, especially regional level, like in their own countries. 
like what they really see the issues and they really have this, they will be really interesting to see the perspective which they use and what they really see the issues. So they can report or consult their government, for example, I mean, to, at, at the city's level and government level and they build beyond international level, such as at the union level. So for example, so for the, to like, so basically by engaging with youth-led organization like Yango, that is one of the tasks that can be achieved by joining youth organizations because everyone work together as a like youth collective is a like grassroots movement. So it's, it doesn't have to be a regional movement, but people, the young people can definitely involve at more international level. So everyone can lis listen to each other and learn more from each other because we're all from global north and global south. Like it's really difficult to understand the situations if we haven't been to the other countries. And it's really important for us to think systematically as well. Mm -hmm. And continue on. I mean, that is one of some examples. So like, I just have this really brief like picture about the pictures about children and youth. So as children grow up, they become young adults and they, they become adults. So it's very essential for children to start early and be very engaged at a young age so that they have more chance of learning and get more engaged with the cities and high level people because the children have the empowerment and power to be really engaged with like at the level. So as children grow up, they become parents and those parents are equally important because parents are role models of children. So if the parents have in the background environment, like in conservation, they can pass their knowledge experience to their children and, and so that their children can therefore be more engaged in the conservation environment, for example, and they can really be engaged. So for example, they can also get like this international conferences and get started spearhead early. Yeah. So parents are really important. Like without parents, we really are lacking opportunities. So these are just some pictures I put in like an example. Like the like people can have a like a youth like conference at university or high school, for example. Like this youth can really like lead have leadership skills as well, and also learning opportunities to really learn about these SDGs in get incorporated and from uh, like bottom level and going higher level. It's like a collection of the same minded people. And in, yes. And then yeah, basically it's all about youth empowerment in the end. And yeah, so, so I forgot to say, but I'm a policy specialist. Like I'm really interested in policy. If I really need to, so I just started with policy that even though lobbying and having grassroots movement is important, but having a recommendation use paper is really also really important because that is one of the documents we can show to the government or union, like what what in our in the in the words, so, so they know what we are doing and have a more detailed and more like advanced skills, I should say. Yes. Yeah, that's all. I mean, I really try my best to make my pretty easy to understand. So, yeah. And, um, any more questions? Like, yeah, I hope that was really understandable. Any questions? Thank you, Yoko. Thank you. Thank you so much for amazing, actually amazing, amazing pictures. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's late. I see that most people left. Yeah, we really need to make, yeah, don't worry about that. I mean, it's something expected already, so. Thank you, Nina. Thank you.
and that was a great presentation. Now we are going to do a great look at home, so a fast one, so that we will work on some specific point. So we are going to to, to share the room. Are you muted, John? Are you talking? I mean, this, I mean, most people, Paul, yeah, continue, yeah, please speak on, Paul. Paul? Uh, is that a uh, raise handed by mistake? Paul, are you going to speak? Because I see your hand raised. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it, it was really long meeting. So thank you everyone to be here. If there's no more questions, I mean, I don't, then we can end this meeting. Could, Thank you, and yes, thank you for joining. And I forgot to say, but if for young girl, you guys can always contact us if you want to join. Yeah, thank you, see you all. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. So glad you were coming. So see you next time for another event. We're very happy to have you there. Bye.